Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Victor. Um, I'm good to be back. Uh, I'm very happy to be back at ACCU. This is my first conference in 2021. I'm really, really excited. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed the, the talk so far. I know I did. And the chat. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a different environment, but uh, I guess we all got used to it by now. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I'm having fun. I hope you uh, you do as well. So today uh, I want to talk to you about uh, my C++ universe. And uh, of course, this will be a very subjective uh, presentation. And I'm uh, very um, excited to hear your opinions. And I'm sure you have uh, diverging point of points of view. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, very enthusiastic to uh, share uh, these experiences with you and see uh, what's your take on this, uh, if you have any experience in this regard and uh, strong opinions and uh, maybe advice for me. So um, I'm very excited and let's get started. Uh, due to the format of uh, the short talk and the delivery medium, I would encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A tab uh, uh, in Zoom, and I'll uh, try to answer as much as I can uh, towards the end of the presentation. And uh, if that would not be possible to cover um, every discussion or every uh, question that you might have, feel free to reach out to me either on Remo or the Discord server. And I'm happy to have one-on-one um, -on -one chats or group chats with you about this, these topics. Um, I'm really curious what you think. So uh, I've been working in the software industry for quite a while now, almost 20 years. Um, I've been working on uh, commercial products, uh, mainly C++. I've done C++ most of my professional career. Uh, and uh, I've delved into some open source projects as well. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about a different perspective I have, uh, and that it's not from the industry, and it's uh, in... Um, a special uh, uh, experience that I've had um, in teaching. I'm not a trained teacher. I am not part of academia, but I um, I do have some experience in doing this um, through my alma mater, University of Craiova there, and specifically um, uh, computer, the computer engineering department uh, from my um, uh, uni days. And I've been a regular guest at uh, the computer engineering department of uh, University of Craiova. I've given uh, invited lectures and workshops on using C++, algorithms, optimization techniques, programming techniques, uh, both for freshmen and sophomores. And um, for over six years, I gave a series of workshops on using C++ STL for competitive programming and software development. Um, uh, myself and uh, some of my colleagues um, and our friends in academia, we coached teams of, uh, for student competitions like ACM, uh, ICPC. And every year, uh, this has become a tradition for several years now in the um, uh, beginning of summer. In collaboration with um, uh, our friends in academia, uh, I organize and teach a free workshop, um, Open for Tech Summer School for Software. It's targeted mainly at college um, uh, freshmen, and uh, we have quite a few of uh, high school students attending as well. So um, this is the, the point of view uh, that I'm relating to you. Uh, it's not from a traditional professor. Um, it's not from years and years in academia. It's my brush with uh, meeting students and um, mentoring students as interns and onboarding uh, young uh, people joining our teams. And uh, things I've regularly seen uh, these last few years and discussions I've had with uh, my friends in academia and with students. And I'm trying to share some ideas uh, with you today and looking forward to see um, what your experience is. Um, on this matter. Topics I've covered over the years uh, in my lectures and workshops, starting with uh, programming techniques and algorithms, uh, talks on graphs and trees, node-based data structures in general, um, many talks and lectures on C++. Um, I even, even dealt into functional programming with Haskell and C++. So I tried quite a few things to see um, 
which one best resonates with students and where I'm most successful at in teaching students new concepts and showing them applied concepts in real software, not just academic toy examples. So I would start with student expectations. <laughs> Um, every student starting out, uh, they have this uh, idea of uh, everything being made out of software and software eating the world and they want to be a part of it and they're very enthusiastic and um, they might have even um, done some programming in high school and they have um, some aspirations and expectations uh, when starting um, uh, year one let's say, and uh, for the longest time, uh, ever since I was a student uh, there um, almost 20 years ago, and up until now, uh, C++ have been, uh, has been a staple diet in, uh, in universities uh, all across my country. And uh, from my um, uh, experience and uh, knowledge throughout universities across Europe as well. So their first contact uh, usually uh, it's quite abrupt. <laughs> uh, many of them uh, haven't done uh, any C++ in, in high school. And uh, their first ex encounter with, with uh, programming per se um, seems a little bit rough, uh, let's say. So they meet a, a, a very uh, steep learning curve and they have uh, lots of struggles, both in terms of uh, comprehension and uh, algorithms and language and syntax and tooling and uh, for many of them it's uh, quite um, discouraging um, but C++ as a first language really uh, is this the best way to go it is is this the best way to, to teach uh, students programming um, because we're actually doing this uh, are we doing it for uh, historical reasons alone uh, do, we, do we still think it's the best tool for the job? Um, I'm really curious to see uh, and hear different opinions and um, maybe see um, several alternative uh, curriculum or uh, onboarding paths for programming in CS1. Um, I, I'm not gonna uh, give away the, the ending here. So <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to try to explore um, a few things about uh, taking C++ as a first step language uh, in uni. Um, this, tag, this tagline actually is not mine, it's from uh, Patrice Roy. Uh, he's a professor in Canada. Uh, he's a, a professor with many, many years of experience in teaching um, college students and university students C++ and doing workshops uh, I've actually uh, done a workshop with Patrice a few years ago, and he's a fantastic teacher and with many, many years of experience. And uh, I do recommend that you watch this presentation from Patrice uh, from CPPCon um, 2019. It's a very good uh, point of view um, in talk in using C++ and uh, approach to teaching um, programming with C++ as a first language. So I do encourage you to uh, uh, pick at this uh, presentation from Patrice. I really enjoyed it. Some common themes I keep hearing in the C++ community around um, teaching and uh, teaching with C++. Um, there is a lot of room for us to make C++ more teachable, obviously, <laughs> and improve the quality of C++ teaching in uni. Uh, in terms of curriculum, in terms of examples, in terms of um, tool chains. Um, so long as we're not talking about CS1. This is the, the always, always uh, present uh, catch uh, when people claim that C++ is fine for um, um, teaching uh, programming uh, at, and starting programming. So there's always this catch. As long as we're not talking about the first uh, encounter, about the first uh, programming class, um, it's okay. And uh, another uh, theme I keep hearing is that students first have to get over the hurdle of being algorithmic thinking uh, thinkers and uh, thinking in terms of problem solving and uh, algorithms and steps and um, procedure 
procedures, and then we can give them a language that has these sharp edges like C++. And that's uh, hard to argue against um, because there are lots of sharp edges. <laughs> Uh, and I've tried different ways. Uh, I've taught C++ uh, from right from the start. Uh, I started with STL. Uh, I taught. I tried to teach a functional style. Um, uh, I taught uh, uh, a course in Haskell. I tried to teach a course in uh, functional C++. So try to uh, do like a, a melange of um, down to low level things and higher level abstractions and thinking in terms of values and um, um, immutability and leveraging uh, algorithm composition and doing more functional C++. Uh, in here, uh, a great guide for me has been um, uh, Ivan's book, uh, Functional Programming in C++. Uh, I think uh, it's well known by now. Uh, I do recommend that you get it and uh, browse through. It's well worth the read. Um, so I tried various things. Um, in my experience, uh, these concepts like functional programming seem more foreign to, to students than, than anything else. And I think I've had uh, success more with STL algorithms and C++ as in classic C++ with the modern facilities uh, than with anything else like functional programming. But my experience is limited in this regard, I, and I would really like to hear for uh, people that tried, like, let's say, uh, Python or JavaScript or, um, I don't know, Kotlin or something. Um, we do have some sharp edges, and um, students always stumble upon th these things um, immediately, <laughs> almost immediately. Uh, we we have uh, quite a few things, both on the language side and the library side. Uh, if you know what that thing on the left, all those uh, braces and square brackets mean, uh, yeah, I feel for you. It, that's valid syntax. Um, and if you think about such a simple concept like a standard pair, and you, you think about the, the fact that you have um, almost 10 constructors for for such a simple thing as a standard pair, um, it's quite uh, numbing <laughs> uh, to get started with uh, um, using STL, and uh, it's quite a shock. And you you would think that um, the language is built that's in such a way that the best overloads are always picked, and the intuition uh, of um, uh, novice learning the language would be met by the library and the constraints that uh, it has on various overloads, but it's not always the case. I'm not, not even going to get into uh, uniform initialization and base, uh, curly base uh, initialization syntax, because that's a whole other talk. <laughs> and it's an hour long talk. Uh, <laughs> some examples that perplex students, uh, for example, uh, uh, Recent inspiration for this uh, came from um, uh, Jason and Victor. Uh, and I've seen this many, many times, like uh, constructing strings. Uh, such a, a simple thing to start with. Uh, many programs and many, many test programs have to deal with strings. And uh, such a simple task as constructing a standard string uh, here in two ways, uh, starting from uh, um, another string, or starting from a string literal, such a simple concept, and the fact that standard string has uh, 11 constructors, and uh, some of them don't play together nicely, and they're very confusing for seasoned programmers, not just uh, people starting to learn the language today. Uh, it's a testament that uh, using basic, a basic um, vocabulary type, such as a standard string, it could turn out to be quite a challenge. And there are no real uh, good diagnostic and uh, warnings that are uh, built into the modern compilers to help here. Really, you're at the mercy of your uh, um, experience uh, here. And if we're talking about modern C++, um, if they encounter vocabulary types, uh, newer vocabulary types such as string view, uh, is really, really, really easy to hang yourself there. Uh, and turns out to be really easy, actually by design, to convert from a string 
uh, to convert um, a string to a string view or a standard vector or array to a standard span in C++20. So dangling uh, is almost the default behavior there. Uh, I have a whole talk about that uh, on a subject alone. And uh, simple constructs that need a thorough explanation for students uh, to understand uh, lifetime and lifetime extension and how to deal with uh, references and objects that have value and or reference semantics. These turn, turn out to be quite a uh, handful to, uh, to chew through uh, in, in the first uh, weeks of uh, learning to program. So um, you could say there are um, uh, CPP core guidelines and um, things are uh, well documented and you can deal with this. But really, nobody reads docs, and they count on the tools to help them. And uh, we have tools, um, but you have to teach them about using the tools and what's available there. Um, for example, in Clang Tidy, there is a check that can help you with uh, dangling stuff like uh, string views that are attached to uh, temporaries. Um, uh, there are flags, for example, like the experimental W lifetime flag in Clang. Uh, now we have a, a W dangling GSL a warning that's enabled, thankfully, by default in Clang 10 and newer versions. So there are tools to help, uh, but it's not always the case that uh, they will teach you the good practice or warn you when you're in danger. So just for string checks alone, uh, there are quite a few checks in, in Clang Tidy, and overall, like, there are over 300 checks in Clang Tidy. So it's quite a daunting task to know what to look for and to know what to turn on, because uh, you cannot actually turn on everything because the noise uh, to benefit ratio is just too great. And if you have to talk about, for example, like uh, sorting, uh, another uh, elementary task, and if we're talking about uh, algorithms and ordering collections, Sorting is such a fundamental, elementary part of uh, doing this, and uh, it gets to be really hairy uh, when you encounter so many strange new uh, concepts, uh, pun intended, uh, when dealing with the standard sort. Um, you have to deal with templates uh, because you meet the standard library. You have to learn about iterators, about const expr, about uh, named requirements, and uh, more recently about uh, standard concepts. So um, right then and there, um, I, I have to talk about um, b b function objects and predicates and binary predicates and tell them it's important because there are over 50 facilities in the STL alone that expect some kind of compare uh, names requirement. So they have to under really understand what, what's involved there. Um, they have to figure out what kind of ordering relationship is required between the elements of a collection so that uh, they can define a proper uh, compare um, function. Um, then we have to deal into the gnarly details of uh, the properties of this relationship and the order uh, they, they need to satisfy. And from my experience, their intuition usually uh, gravitates towards partial ordering. And then I have to go through quite a few examples and show them uh, when this holds and when it doesn't, and it's very surprising for them every time they see it. Um, and we have to analyze then their, their intuition, usually very wrong here. Uh, for example, when trying to comp uh, compare um, a, a, a pair type data structure like a point, uh, the intuition is always wrong and I have to de uh, analyze with them uh, to see, uh, to make them see then uh, when uh, these properties don't hold and to understand uh, equivalence relationships and ambiguities in ordering um, elements. And then we have to go into uh, strengthening the relationship and talk about strict weak ordering, and that's a whole other mess. <laughs> and then we have to complete the, the requirements and strengthen the requirements of the, order, the ordering relationship and talk about strict total ordering, and it really gets messy. And then they try to and figure out for themselves, usually, to find a better predicate uh, to use as a compare for a two-part structure. And then we ine inevitably have to talk about lexicographic compare and about ties and how to use that and where can we find such concepts in the standard library, for example, in pair, in tuple 
and talk about lexicographic order in general and comparing uh, by parts. Whew. Uh, uh, that's a whole, uh, uh, whole strain of uh, hours spent there in examples and in analyzing examples and the underlying theoretical requirements just to make them uh, build an intuition for what's right and what's wrong and what it ca what can go wrong uh, when when defining uh, a, co a simple compare function. Because the, their instinct is uh, usually uh, straightforward in terms of reaching the right syntax and um, um, figuring out how, how to make it compile and it usually works, but they're always fumbling about in terms of uh, semantic uh, requirements and what exactly uh, does the, the, the types they're using, what exactly the types they're using, um, what properties they need to um, preserve in order to build a proper uh, relationship uh, when comparing them. So uh, they always struggle with this and I, I've, I've seen this uh, every year and um, we go through the same motions and I keep in trying to improve the way I, I uh, show them examples and the way I uh, explain it. But, um, it's a recurring theme. And we do have new challenges, of course, uh, in 2020, I kept doing these uh, uh, invited lectures at my alma mater. So we did it uh, online like everyone else. Uh, <laughs> here you can see the, uh, this uh, actual example and the puzzled face on uh, that, uh, that student's face. There. <laughs> uh, we have uh, an important challenge, in my opinion, in remote learning and teaching online in terms of uh, turning on the cameras. Um, I, I know it's a sub sensitive subject, but I do feel strongly that uh, uh, an instructor really needs to see uh, its students to be able to gauge uh, their engagement, to, to gauge um, their reaction and get uh, visual feedback uh, when they're bored or when they're clueless or when they might want to ask something, but they're too shy to uh, turn on their mic or something. So actually, I know it's a sen sensitive uh, topic for many people, but turning on the camera really helps. I'm, I have many friends that are trainers, professional trainers and teachers, and uh, this is a recurring theme in 2020. So usually at work, when you're meeting, uh, almost everyone turns on their camera. It's usually a small team. Everyone is uh, excited to see each other because we're not in the office anymore. So uh, it, it's a different mood. So uh, uh, camera on is almost the default. Uh, in workshops for companies, uh, some friends of mine, uh, trainers claimed that 50, 70% of the attendees uh, usually turn on their cameras. Uh, in open workshops that are paid, uh, same trainers claim that the percentage is way lower, like 20-50%, and they keep encouraging people to turn on their cameras. So, But uh, for university students in courses and seminars, uh, both myself and my friends see an average of 10% uh, um, of students who actually turn on their camera. And it's very difficult to know if you're doing a good job uh, if they're very shy in interacting with you, either by uh, intervening on the mic or uh, seeing their uh, facial cues uh, to know if you're striking a, a, a good uh, uh, method there. So uh, beyond 2021, uh, teaching C with C++ in uni, is this a lost cause? Uh, I think not. Uh, I've gained a lot of experience in this matter and I, I, I want to keep improving and I, I still think it's a good tool for the job. I don't think it's the only tool, but I, I still think it's a good tool. Uh, and Model C++ is simpler and safer and we have tremendous opportunities to make it more teachable, uh, clearly. <laughs> And uh, you can get involved, everyone can get involved. There's actually a study group, SG20, uh, in the uh, ISO C++ committee. And I do recommend that you watch this uh, fantastic talk by uh, Chris, uh, specifically on how to teach C++ and influence the generation and about um, what you can do to uh, get involved and access the resources that the SG20 publishes and maybe contribute. So I think this should be an effort that we can all get behind and make it so that uh, people are not discouraged when they first meet C++. So the old king is dead, long live the king. 
C++. Um, I, I think we don't have enough time for questions now. Um, I, I, I think I'm going to let... Um, let's see. Let's check the questions. Uh, I have uh, a question that I, I can answer quickly. Any good courses in Coursera, uh, edX, elsewhere for more than C++? Um, um, there are many resor good resources. Uh, I would recommend uh, starting with uh, Kate Gregory's uh, plural site uh, uh, beginner's course for C++. I think that's a good one. There are several others, but that's the one that I keep uh, sending people to and I get the best uh, feedback uh, when they do it. Um, uh, okay, uh, I, being a little bit out of time, I'm gonna try to see if we have any, times, any time left uh, at the end and I'm gonna leave my colleagues and uh, give their, give their uh, the speaking token. Bye.